Pelletiers. Um, I'm coming from you, to you from my brown chair, which Ian, who is in my program, seems to love. Um, I just got home from this event put on by the English Literature Society and the Department of English, as well as career counseling. And what it was was basically what to do after English. So us, personally, who are doing English Lit undergrads and graduate studies, need a little bit of help sometimes in trying to figure out our careers. So there were some guest speakers, and one of them was our very own Danica, and she did such a great job. I filmed her, so I know it's a little bit longer than my vlogs usually are, but you should really give her a chance and listen to her personal experiences in this world of English and the way she came about knowing she wanted to be a teacher, which doesn't happen for everyone as easily um, as some people, I would say. So this is goodbye from me. Um, see ya. Please watch Danica. She's so great. She was very informative and inspiring. I look up to her. You want the long or the short version? You know, it sounds really fancy pants when uh, Professor Jameson describes my career and it sounds like I really knew what I was doing, but honestly, you are so <laughs> lucky you're here at Carleton because hearing Yvonne speak, I think, God, I wish that I had had someone tell me it's okay to do a spiral and that some days it felt like I was just circling around. Um, when I started, I knew I liked working with people and I, I'm um, American as well, so I knew I wanted to live in New York. My family's from Kentucky and uh, I'm a city kid. Let's just leave it at that. So I started at McGill, um, I wanted to be a gynecologist really close to that dream. So when people would say, what do you want to do with your degree? I want to be a gynecologist. Um, I failed out of science. <laughs> I mean spectacularly. I got A pluses in English and Fs in science. And with the help from my mom who looked at my degree and, or my uh, transcript and said, I think we have a problem here. I think you're, uh, you should be in English. I said, I'm not an artsy. And she's like, well, you're really not. <laughs> and then we had one of those reverse conversations where I think a lot of parents say, well, what are you going to do with that English degree? My mom said, what are you going to do with science degree? Oh, I'm going to be a gynecologist. She's like, you're the BSc, you're going to be a test tube washer. Or you're going to have to go to medical school. Like, this is years of study. And that kind of came crashing down on my head. And she said, why don't you do something that you're interested in and something that you love and something that you're good at? Why don't you get an English degree? And I said, what am I going to do with that? And she said, you can do anything. And she was pointing out also, I mean, English is the language of the business world. And I've certainly seen that in my career. People cannot write. People cannot communicate. And there is miscommunication all over. And even worse, when English is people's third, fourth, fifth language. I wound up in my last job. Um, doing communication coaching to executives privately because they didn't want anybody to know that they were meeting with me, but they couldn't convey their ideas in English, and some of whom had had a career working in English. Reading reports, careful reading, all those things that you're learning, explicating poems, well, what am I going to do with that? I'm not going to read Tennyson later. Yeah, try reading a request for proposal. I was in sales for a while, and so a customer is going to write this long legal document saying, here's what I want from you. And then you look through and you pick apart, oh, well, we can do this, we can do this. Hey, let's throw in free training. We'll put that in. And so you are doing a careful reading of a document where, again, when I was at IBM, I, was, I wound up coaching some of my bosses on how to read these documents. Why? Because I could do careful reading. I could read between the lines, and I could push it a little bit, and I could fill it in. Those are skills that I had learned. Now, I didn't realize how portable and marketable they are. So I wound up thinking, well, I like people, and I want to move to New York. And I knew someone that I met at a party who worked at IBM who said, why don't you work at IBM? And I was like, I am not corporate. I do not like that. I didn't want to work in a cubicle. But he said, if you go into sales or training, you're, you don't go to the same place every day. So I started in training different offices all the time, which was pretty interesting. I taught the executives at Royal Bank in downtown Toronto. I taught the OPP and the police force. I mean, and everything in between. 
And so I got to see all different companies and work environments and how people work, and, and I don't like going to the same place. Also, I could just buy two suits and just recycle them. <laughs> I wash them, I dry clean them. <laughs> and then I wound up moving up and getting into sales and, and getting myself to New York, which was really not at all a career plan. I was just like, oh, I wanna get to New York. And I got there and it was pretty exciting. One of the things about working at a big company, and even if you feel like you may not be corporate or I felt like I didn't want to be a sellout, so I had long hair to my waist. I shaved it off like in a zero buzz cut and dyed it silver and bought a three-piece suit and was like, if I'm going to go corporate, I'm just going to go all the way. Bought a briefcase. Um, but what IBM did for me was they did a ton of career planning, a ton of training. I had an executive sponsor. I was on the executive resource list. Any classes I wanted to take, they did. They did the Myers-Briggs personality test, which at the time was about $2,000 to do privately, which by the way, you all are getting, it's free, right? Yeah. You all are getting it free, <laughs> go, go do it. Because also what it showed me is, I'm terrible at organization. I'm great with people. I kind of knew that anyway, but it helped me direct where I wanna be and where I'm gonna be successful and happiest. So I left IBM in New York. Um, partly the pressure was phenomenal, and you can run that hard for so long, but it was a great job and a great life, but ultimately not for me. And there are a lot of reasons in my Myers-Briggs test why it wasn't the right place. Um, and I got back together with my boyfriend, now husband. <laughs> we thought, life is great in Montreal. So I moved up there and I wound up creating a job for myself. Uh, I started doing communications consulting. I joined those two professional organizations that I talked about and just kind of put myself out there and said, look, here's what I've done, here's what I can do. And at the time, I really wanted to travel. So I wound up running communications workshops at CETA, which was a company that works with engineers globally. And I went everywhere. I was in South Africa for a month, Singapore, Frankfurt, London, Cairo. It was amazing. So I got to see the world. Now on my resume, I have English degree, communication skills, corporate experience with IBM, and global experience. Well, everybody's working globally now, and all with an English degree. The other thing I'll tell you is when I started at IBM, I was super cynical and like, how many people here have English degrees? And the man who hired me said, well, I thought you'd ask that. So he looked up, <laughs> and he said, on my team of 33 people, 28 have humanities degrees. One has no degree, he ran a scuba dive shop. And another we hired from Apple also has no degree and hates IBM. And I was like, why would you hire all these people with humanities degrees or people who don't really like IBM? But he said, we can teach you the technology, but we cannot teach you to relate to people. We cannot teach you to communicate. That's inherent, you either have it or you don't. Yeah. And that was phenomenal. And still, IBM will only hire um, or, or mostly hire people with humanities degrees for customer facing roles. And I was shocked because I thought it was all computer science and it's not. Also, you're working with some phenomenally great people. And my last point, which goes back to what my mom said about doing what you love, uh, I had a phenomenal GPA. When I switched over, it turns out when you switch faculties, at least it used to, your GPA starts over. So those Fs are kind of gone. <laughs> IBM wanted my official transcript from McGill, and they will not hire under a certain GPA. I had no idea when I was doing my degree, but it turned out that I was lucky that I got very good grades, and I got good grades because I was doing what I loved. And so when I went to get hired there, they needed a copy of my degree and a copy of my official transcript, and it was no problem, doors open. So doors open with an English degree, and I've done some really amazing things. Ultimately, not where I want to be. Uh, I always miss school, so I wanted to do a master's in English, and I want to teach, because what it's taken me a long time to realize is that that is my calling. Uh, it just took me a while to get there. And so here I am doing a master's degree. I'm a super big fan of Carleton, and the program here is amazing. And also, I've hired people in, in the corporate world, and we hire people a lot with uh, undergrad and master's degrees. At IBM, you could not be a manager without a master's degree. There were some exceptions, but that was the general rule. And it almost didn't matter what it was in, but lots of MAs in English. And again, for that key communication. Thank you. <laughs>